Hi, everybody. I wanted to take a few moments and summarize some of the things that we've been talking about and kind of lay out a picture so that we can consider um, this idea of revolution and uh, what is revolution. Is revolution good? Is a revolution bad? Um, and in particular, this is a, an interesting time in our country where there's a lot of tension uh, regarding some of the things that the federal government is doing. Uh, there's even a group right now in Oregon who is uh, holed up in a um, in a building and some are calling uh, you know them terrorists and other people are um, you know defending their their actions as a pushback against the federal government and and things like this um, really bring uh, to bear um, some of the um, emotion and and kind of bring us up close to what we oftentimes try to read about in history. And so we've kind of been considering these things, looking at uh, the American War for Independence, looking at the French Revolution. And in particular, as we read Edmund Burke's uh, reflection on the revolution in France, remember this is a letter that he's writing uh, to someone who's uh, written to him to solicit his support, and they want to make sure uh, or, or ask him to, um, I guess, give... Uh, give his support to it, and Burke is not um, fond of the French Revolution. Matter of fact, he's a he's a severe critic of it, and this is surprising to a lot of people. They were quite concerned about it because Burke was in support um, of the American War for Independence. And remember, Burke is a statesman, a, a, a statesman for uh, Great Britain, and uh, born in in Ireland, and uh, is a very strong. Um, uh, rhetorician and and so his opinions very weighty and so people are very surprised that he's in favor you know as an Englishman uh, or, or part of Great Britain he's he's uh, favoring the American War for Independence uh, but then now he's he's really decrying uh, the French Revolution and so Burke had some real key insights uh, for a lot of reasons uh, as to why this was not a good thing and so hopefully we can break some of those things down and and take a look at them just kind of in an introductory and, and cursory way. And and so one of the first things we have to try to distinguish uh, between is um, who are the parties involved um, when when we look at the American uh, you know, war for independence and we look at the French Revolution. The second thing we want to consider is what exactly is revolution and and what makes one thing uh, you know, like the American War for Independence, a certain kind of thing, um, and the French Revolution, a different kind of thing. And, and so we're going to take a look at that a little bit and then look at some of the different ideologies that um, are, are pushing or driving uh, these different movements. <clears throat> and so in the first place on the back here, uh, I want to just kind of point out um, some of the ideas. This is, this is very broad brushed and uh, not able to um, you know, for given space and time, not able to really uh, break these apart entirely. Um, but, but I want to just kind of give you some summary ideas. Oftentimes, um, as we look back on history, we're looking through a particular lens uh, that, that we're in. And we've got to remember that we're not, you know, we're not born in a vacuum. America isn't what it is today uh, because it just appeared this way and it hasn't always been this way. The world hasn't always been this way. So <clears throat> typically, the typical American, you know, particularly now in an election year, we're very heightened uh, in our awareness to the fact that there are Democrats and there are Republicans. And generally speaking, um, we're going to look at the Democrats as the more liberal or progressive party, and the Republicans are going to be seen as the more conservative. Another term that's often used is right wing and left wing. And we want to make sure that we understand what these things mean um, in their entirety. Another word uh, we often see is conservative. And so people say, well, I'm a conservative. Some people say, I'm a liberal. Uh, and they'll identify themselves uh, you know, in different ways. And so when we're uh, thinking about Burke and, and what he has to say about the French Revolution, uh, we have to kind of step back from our current mindset and we have to understand the way the world was working and, and the way the things are. And, and so when we go back to the 18th century, <clears throat> what we call the, you know, the time of the Enlightenment, um, really the Enlightenment is, um, you know, to a large extent, uh, it is a way of trying to do life 
without God. You know, we oftentimes, you know, look at the Enlightenment as something uh, to be proud of, something, you know, an achievement of mankind. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with the Enlightenment, and and we'll see that here as we as we look at um, you know the thinking that comes behind it, and and so the Enlightenment, the idea of of man's ability to reason, and you know of course we call it the age of reason, and and man's ability really it boils down to man's ability to try and save himself and having his empirical evidence, and, and that's the boundaries by which he's going to take a look at the world. So reality, uh, for those in the Enlightenment, and again, this is very broad-brushed, um, oftentimes is a very materialistic world. And so reality is just that physical thing that can be seen. There's nothing metaphysical. Um, there's nothing, as Plato would say, in the realm of the forms. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing uh, beyond our ability to see. <clears throat> and so... Um, this uh, cause, these, these Enlightenment, um, the, the people of the Enlightenment, uh, were really strong uh, progressives. The idea that man is progressing and needs to continue to change to make things better, which is not a bad idea in and of itself that we would always try to make things better. And, and so um, their attempt, however, to make things better um, comes with some consequence uh, because it leaves some certain things out, as we'll see in a few moments. And so you have this group over here, and, and I'm going to call these the revolutionaries. Uh, this is kind of what uh, the textbook refers to, um, you know, the different groups of revolutionaries and, and the way that they're wanting to make things change. And, of course, when we're talking about the French Revolution, um, <clears throat> a revolution... Uh, is to overthrow one form of government in order to set up another form of government. And so uh, revolutionaries, you know, a progressive way of thinking is we need to throw off the old way, whether that's throw off the church, whether that's throw off um, the, the monarchy, uh, the empire, what, whatever it is that has been oppressing us. We want to throw them off and so we can, um, in, in many ways, uh, become equal and we, we can have all these this equal station and not have the haves and the have-nots and that's usually the the narrative in some way or another um, that, that is taught so we have the progressives or the revolutionaries and they're of uh, an enlightenment ideology now one of the things that's important to distinguish uh, between the right wing and the left wing and this goes all the way back to um, you know, to you know, in the French Revolution, and uh, in 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 another place where the uh, people who are more progressive would sit on the left one side of the building, and, and the others would sit on the right side, and so this is the left wing, and this is the right wing, and and so they they kind of were against each other, and <clears throat> the thing that's important that we recognize is that progressives, whether the right wing of the progressive Enlightenment movement or whether the left wing of the progressive enlightenment movement, they're all facing the same way. And if I could summarize it and say it this way, man can save himself. Man has the ability uh, to do for himself. There is no God. We don't need God. Or if there is God, he's more of just a moral teacher and a friend. Uh, he's a helper. Um, but really, there's probably no God. Most materialists said, no, you know, there's no God because, you know, really, how could bad things happen to good people if there was a God? And then if there was a God and bad things happen to good people, then what kind of God is he? And so really, you know, some sort of reasoning along this line um, is, is kind of the ideology that drives both the right and the left wing of the Enlightenment or progressive or revolutionary thinkers. So um, now we, we often think in terms of right wing, we think, well, okay, there's the conservative Republicans or we have the more liberal Democrats in our modern day. Um, but, but these all... You know, these all reach this this line of, of um, you know, in, in history um, over a certain trajectory. And we don't have time to discuss all the ways that, that the trajectory was. Um, but I want you to consider it maybe this way. And our textbook kind of illustrates it in some various ways. And other people have tried to explain it. And <clears throat> and so the the idea of a revolutionary says this. If, if the house is dirty... If the house is broken, if there's something wrong, then the very best way to solve this problem is just simply to burn the house down. All right? We just we just level it, we annihilate it, we don't want the house anymore. And so the revolutionary mindset is just to, to tear it down and we'll build something new. 
all right? And <clears throat> now the right wing and the left wing have a little bit different approach to how we fix these problems. You're more progressive or left wing of the progressive movement you know they they want to use dynamite they want to burn the house down now they want to they they just want to um you know light a match burn it down and let the chips fall where they may and then they'll build something out of the rubble the right wing has more of an idea of well let's dismantle the house but we can dismantle it you know one shingle and one brick at a time and and, and we'll tear it down but but you know we want to go a certain way get rid of the old conventions make things better for men we want to do it slower we want to tear the band-aid off slower and these guys they want to tear it off quickly um, one way that it's been described is um, <clears throat> the idea of a man um, you know who is gaining weight uh, one one writer said you know if you think of a person who's gaining weight uh, at you know 10 pounds a month um, the left wing is gonna say hey we need to get him to start gaining pounds at um, you know at 12 pounds a month and the the right wing is gonna say well no we want him to only lose weight um, or, or gain weight sorry at um, you know at eight pounds a month but the idea never occurs to them that we put the guy on a diet the idea never occurs to them that let's get him healthy the idea is just you know let's you know he's gonna blow up um, and, and let's speed up the process or let's let him last as long as possible um, I like the idea better and I think it, it, it reflects it more accurately the idea of, of let him bleed out so if you know if he's losing so much you know a minute of blood you know he's gonna die pretty quickly and they're like saying let's increase it and they're saying well let's back off and see if we can't you know put a tourniquet around it and let him bleed out slower and <clears throat> the important thing to recognize is that on this side whether it's slow or whether it's fast they're headed the same direction it's it's a world that has a particular ideology that we don't need God I'm going to talk about three of those ideologies here in a few moments that kind of mark them out and on this side I'm gonna turn it this way here on this side over here um, I'm gonna to lump together kind of what we call the conservatives generally Christians or people who believe in a natural law um, and you know and, and again there's some variations here you have some Christians uh, you know who would um, you know not hold to a natural law position a um, <clears throat> you know you have some conservatives maybe who are not Christians Christians um, you know usually fit into that category so so this is what we're gonna look at is our Christian worldview conservative Christian worldview that believes in natural law and and so um, the important thing is to recognize that conservatives are not right-wingers. And the reason for that is conservatives have an idea that there's something that needs uh, to be conserved. There's something that we have to conserve. There's something that is, that is natural, that is innate uh, in, um, in this world. And, and it needs to be uh, conserved. There's certain ways we want change, certainly. Conservatives aren't against change altogether. We just want it to occur in a natural sort of way. And <clears throat> so in our text, um, there's three things just to note in our text that um, that kind of lays out what what is the ideology um, that kind of separates you know these two groups well here's here's kind of a uh, best way we can look at it is that the uh, whether it's right or left wing the progressive or revolutionary side they're really bent on um, or um, really in love with the abstract they're bent on seeing the world in abstract kind of realities um, uh, the the old idea that you know everybody wants to change the world but uh, but nobody wants to help mom with the dishes and and so we're in love with the abstract that's what was so strange about the French Revolution is that in order to preserve life they murdered thousands of people uh, just thousands of people were just being slaughtered the reign of terror and and so in the abstract we're helping humanity we want to help humanity same thing with Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution same thing with uh, with the Bolshevik Revolution in, in Russia, uh, we we we're for humanity, and and so they're in in love with this abstract. And one of the illustrations that I thought was really helpful in, in thinking about it this way is that in the revolutionaries' mindset, it's very statist that you are 
significant or you are important so long as you are part of the whole. As long as you're a cog in the wheel and you're doing your part, um, that's what makes you valuable. That Your individuality um, has no part in this. because We love humanity, not the individual person, humanity in the abstract. We've got to love people. And, and so this is an area where Christians sometimes um, get caught up and, and we're not careful to think in terms of, you know, what does it mean? Jesus said, love my neighbor. And, you know, we just need to love everybody. And so love and love and love is, is kind of the big, you know, the, the big ideology that everybody's pushing. Um, but to love our neighbor looks a certain way in a very particular way. We can't affirm certain things and, and say that we love our neighbor or we can't affirm certain things in the name of love. Um, without violating certain laws, innate laws or natural laws. And and so if we do that, then it just becomes a sentimentalism. And so to love my neighbor looks a very specific way. But here the abstract is important. Okay, Over here, the individual should be important. And, and we need to look at each individual. And yes, of course, they're, they participate in the whole, but each individual um, is important. Uh, one person used the illustration of a bean bag. You know, as long as you're inside the the big old sack and you're one of the little BBs in there, then then you're okay. Okay, but your significance um, really depends on you being you know in that big bag and and being a part of all the other BBs and and doing your part as just being a BB. <clears throat> so we want to be real careful, you know, in making that distinction. Um, there's a second thing. Uh, the second thing on, on this side, there is what we might call a resentment against the way things are. Now, this isn't going to make me very popular in some people's mindset, but I hope you'll think about it um, as, as we look through it. Um, one of the, one of the, the cries or, or really the, you know, the, the, the mantra of the French Revolution um, uh, was the idea of liberty and equality and fraternity. And liberty is a big, a big word, um, uh, almost as big as love. Liberty is huge. And, 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 and liberty is important, but um, oftentimes liberty um, is, is translated, we, we, we change it, and it's, it's not liberty or freedom to be what we should be or the opportunity to be what God created us to be. It's not the freedom to do what the right thing is. Liberty becomes the freedom to do whatever I want to do or be whatever I want to be. And, you know, we've seen some examples in the news, you know, of, of, of men wanting to be a woman. And, and so they have freedom, you know, that's, that's their choice. We shouldn't, we shouldn't control them, you know, in, in, into this, uh, confine them into this, you know, controlled gender role. Um, <clears throat> one 52 year old dad wanted to be a six year old little girl, you know, so we have these really weird things in the name of equality and the name of, 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 of liberty, everybody having freedom. And, <clears throat> there really becomes this resentment um, by the revolutionary mindset, by the progressives. There's a, there's a resentment against things as they are. Um, you know, this isn't popular to say it, but the, the truth is not everybody is created equal um, in the sense of, you know, they're, they're being born. We all certainly should be equal under the law. And, and, and when we think of what the founders meant when they talked about, you know, in the, in the Declaration of Independence, all of us being equal, the idea is that we all should have equal um, rights under the law. We all should be equal in our opportunities, so to speak. There should be some, some equality or that there should be uh, equality um, in value of each human life. And so all of these things... Um, all of these things are equal, but the truth is we're not equal when we're born. Some people are born tall and some people are born short. Um, some people um, are born um, ugly. Some people are born pretty. Some people are born plain. Some people are born with all their limbs and some people are born uh, with what you know we would call defects. And that's not to put anybody down. That's not to be um, you know um, demeaning to anybody. Just the fact of the matter is we're not all equal in that sense, in the sense of legality, in the sense of value, in the sense of our standing before God. We're all equal. That's, that's absolutely true. But there is a resentment against inequality. There's an, a resentment against things as they are. You know, this is the world. 
as we've been born into it. And the idea with, with the natural man is we can change it. We can conquer nature. As C.S. Lewis would talk about in the abolition of man, man's whole goal is to conquer nature, to be victorious over nature and be anything we want to be. And, you know, the, just the truth of the matter is um, that's not reality. And, and there's a resentment um, in the world uh, among progressives, uh, among the revolutionaries to say that all things, you know, have to be equal. Um, one of the areas where we look at is there are differences between men and women. And that doesn't mean in value. That doesn't mean um, in, in, in their personhood and their standing before God, but in their individual makeup in their psyche, in their physical attributes, um, they're different. And God designed um, ladies with one particular, um, you know, a one particular way, and he, and he designed men uh, in one particular way. And there's a difference. And so, you know, to, to, um, to somehow devalue or resent those differences um, is really this this revolutionary thought. We want to we want to be able to say you know everybody's equal. Anybody can do anything. Anybody else can do. And and so that starts to play out in a very entitled kind of mentality. So maybe you're smarter and faster and stronger than me, but you shouldn't have more than me, or you shouldn't get first place and I get second place, or you shouldn't be richer and I'm poorer. And and so really there becomes this attitude that. It's the outcome that needs to be equal and, and not the opportunity that's equal. So that plays out in several different ways. I hope that um, in some ways I made that clear. Um, but but there's, there's, a, a strong, um, there's a strong attitude of resentment against the world as God made it and in among the revolutionary kind of thinking. And, and one of the sad things uh, that we're seeing is oftentimes Christians in an effort to avoid being um, uh, seeming bigoted or or intolerant or those things, uh, we kind of give in to those things and 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 we let the world and the PC police, you know, tell us what we can and can't say. Um, but you know, God has told us that things are different, and and God has made some and lifted some up and put others down. Um, you know, in in God in in all that He has made has made things different. You know, God made the elephant and He made the duck bill platypus i mean he's god um is creative and he makes things different so not everything is equal in in that kind of sense um the third thing uh third important thing that we have to look at um is and this kind of really depends on which side you fall on the right or left wing or, or somewhere in the middle uh if you're in the revolutionary camp uh, and that is a, a lack of patience um, the right wing is going to be a little more patient and letting things kind of, you know, take their course of nature and let them kind of work themselves out. Um, but but they're still moving to that same end as the left wing. Um, but they want to, you know, take the Band-Aid off slowly. These over here are impatient. You know, let's burn the house down. Let's use dynamite if we have to. Over here says, let's just take it, you know, apart piece by piece if we need to. Um, and And never consider the option over here. Um, in, in the conservative idea, um, we have things like reform, okay? So think of the Reformation. We don't want to burn the church down. We don't want to destroy the church. The church is good and right. Uh, it's an institution, you know, that, that God created. He is the, um, he is the creator of the, the institution of the church. But the church did need reform. And, and so the reformers would be in that mindset of the conservative to reform the church, to make things better, to make things right, to get rid of the corruption. Um, but we don't want to burn the church down. We don't want to get rid of the church. We, we're not against the church. We just want the church to be reformed. And we, we want to, uh, as the reformers often say, you know, um, you know, we're reformed and always reforming. And, and that doesn't mean that we're always changing. That just means that we're always finding ways to apply God's word better uh, in ways that, that make, you know, the world what God designed it to be in the very first place in his redeeming um, work. We want to be involved with God. We want to be on the same page with God in his work of renewal and redemption. And, and so there's this conservative Christian natural law mindset that, um, that really in some ways we abhor the abstract and love the particular. You know, where the other way, this is the other way around, love the abstract and abhor the particular. You know, we we love the individual person or ought to love the individual person more than we like the idea of humanity. Um, and um, 
then we want things to change. We want things to come about in a better way. We want improvement. We want it to happen naturally. Um, you know, we want equality as, as best as possible. Um, and I think when we look at the early American documents, we saw things like that all men are created equal uh, because we have an alienable rights. There's language there that um, that was going to naturally, you know, dissolve things like slavery, that, that, that naturally this was going to come about. And, and so our our forefathers saw that as as, as important um, because it was an idea of natural law, and and we we wanted that to happen, but they didn't foresee things like you know the Supreme Court you know justices redefining marriage, you know making something that isn't something that is. You know you you, you can't you know you can't legally just you know a judge come say well we don't believe in gravity anymore. Um, you know, you walk off a building and you're still going to fall flat on your face. You can't say, well, you know, two men now can marry or two women now can marry and and now under the law, because we've legally said so, that that makes it marriage. Um, ask a plumber. You know, you, you, you just can't, you can't put fittings, uh, you know, together. And that's an oversimplistic uh, way of looking at things. But, um, but it kind of summarizes or, or kind of gives the idea that you can't make things that are one thing and change them into something different just to somebody say so. So yes, we want change for the better, um, but we're going to do it according to natural law. We're going to do it according to what is normal and what is natural, and we recognize there are boundaries. God made the world a certain way. I would love to be a genius. Um, and you know, wouldn't it be you know it'd be stupid for me to walk around resenting and 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 appealing to the court? So you know, make me a genius, call me a genius, uh, but that doesn't make me you know any more a genius. Um, you know, we are what we are because God gave us what He gave us, and so we want to do our best with what He's given us. We don't want to change and redefine what we are. Um, thirdly. <clears throat> Uh, then, you know, we, we look at, um, in our third principle here, that of, um, sorry, I lost my place here. Um, oh, talk about patience. Sorry. Um, we, we want to th see things change, but we don't want to become impatient about it. Uh, we, we want to remain patient. We want to recognize that things take time. And as Christians, we want to apply the gospel. We want to apply the truth um, that Jesus died and rose again. This miracle happened 2,000 years ago that changed everything. And if we were to pan out, we were to look at the world uh, the way God created it and realize in the ancient world, you know, life was brutal. There was, there was, there was a lot of, you know, the, the fallen nature of man was horrible. But when Jesus came in and he died and rose again, this one event that's never happened before, never happened since, this transformational event, the incarnation of God, um, as John says, truth isn't some nebulous idea up here as the Hellenistic world or the Greeks would think. Um, but truth actually became a person. Uh, truth became man. And, and so uh, John says, we knew or, or we, we saw the logos uh, that, that God sent forth um, his son. Uh, Jesus is called in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. That's what I'm trying to say. And, and so the logos, the, uh, the idea of, of understanding what truth is or the reasoned out truth, truth became flesh became human. Jesus is the truth. It's not some nebulous idea. In particular, Jesus is the truth. And so when we begin to see Jesus at work, um, the idea of the gospel at work in the world, we can be patient to let God work out his purposes, applying it wherever we can, where we work, where we live, uh, where we go to church, um, in, in where we go to school. We're applying the gospel in all of these relationships, all these contexts of life. We're living the gospel out and and trusting Lord to patiently change things. Now, let's bring that all back together um, when we understand what, Bur what Edmund Burke is saying when he says the American Revolution, and I cross this out uh, because one of the things we have to be careful about is the language we use, and we call it the American Revolution, but really the way Burke saw it was it was a war for independence. It was King George who, in a sense, was the revolutionary. It was King George who is breaking their own laws by the taxation without representation and, and other um, crimes that he committed against the people. 
they weren't rebels trying to have their own way and steal land. Um, these were Englishmen who were following the law. They had set up their governments and their parliaments according to, uh, to the law, to the laws of Great Britain. And so it was King George who was trying to, you know, enforce his laws outside of the boundaries or his own ideas outside the boundaries of the law. And so they were pushing back against that, saying, no, you don't have a right. You don't have a right to do that. And so they're pushing back against it with the eventual need um, by saying, well, then we're not going to burn the house down. Uh, we're just going to build a new house and draw a property line. We're going to draw the property line and build a new house um, because, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're mistreating this. This isn't right. And so they didn't overthrow a government. They weren't revolutionaries in that sense. Rather, um, they established in righteousness or a right way, um, they established a new nation. And, and, and we put together a constitution um, so that men's rights were protected, that government was limited, and that man wasn't just some wild beast, uh, but he was, in a sense, subject to the laws uh, in a social contract that way, a covenant. Um, and then over here, though, the revolutionaries, they want to burn the house down. And so that's why Burke said, <clears throat> when it came to the French Revolution, this is no good at all. And if you look at history, you look at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So really, um, the entire 19th century bookended, um, you know, with the 18th and 20th century. And you just see revolution after revolution after revolution. And millions and millions of people lost their lives, bloodshed over this idea of revolution. Burn the house down. We're going to establish something new, something based on our own ideas that have nothing to do with natural law. And, and so there was a lack of patience in seeing things change. There was this um, rejection of natural, uh, the way things are naturally. And, um, and there was a um, resentment, I'm sorry, for, for the way things were naturally. And there was this idea that they were in love with the abstract more than they were in love with the particular. So when we look at the American Revolution, we can see truly, for the most part, what it was predominantly, um, it was a conservative attempt. It was, it was a work of conservatives. There were some right wing. We can't deny the fact there was some Enlightenment influence, Jefferson and some that were influential in this and, and in particular uh, were helpful. And so there was kind of a, a, a cooperative effort between the two. Um, but, you know, nowadays, today, there, there certainly wasn't a left-wing element to that at all. Um, it was, you know, more of, you know, some right-wing uh, influence, but primarily driven by these values. Um, and these values that were recognized and understood even by the right-wing um, component of the revolutionary group. And, and so Burke's attitude then comes down to the fact that uh, the American Revolution... Uh, or war for independence would be a better term. That's a good thing. Uh, that was good because it was standing on what was right. The revolution over here, that's a bad thing. So I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, let me just see, is there anything else I needed to touch on? Um, Burke understood, uh, I failed to mention this, that Burke understood uh, and, and could kind of predict these. When you read the reflections on the Revolution of France, he predicted this is going to happen. He wanted to quell it uh, from ever reaching England uh, because he saw it as bloody and ridiculous. And we don't want revolution. Revolution is bloody. Revolution is horrible. Um, we want change done in a conservative way. Sometimes... You know, sometimes they, they called the American Revolution, uh, they called them, um, sorry, they called them the uh, reluctant revolutionaries. Sometimes you're forced into a corner to deal with things, um, and you want to deal with it honestly, with integrity, according to the way things are. And, and so that's kind of where they are. But Burke understood the world. He had a Christian worldview um, that he understood the way that it was going to work. He could see where humanity was going to go. And it played out, you know, nearly, uh, you know, to prophetic, you know, by prophetic standard, very, very forensic in his, uh, in his ability, in his detail uh, to, um, you know, to be able to see these things coming about. So I hope that helps. Uh, put some of these things in, in, your, in your mindset and, uh, and prepares you um, for 
you know, uh, reading Burke and, and looking at the ideas. We'll talk a little bit more about this um, next week uh, and uh, hope to see you then. We'll see you tomorrow in class and uh, God bless you and um, thanks for taking the time to listen and pay close attention.